Good morning, Interweb. World Builders Log 9. Couple of bits of housekeeping before we get started. One, I apologize for this video taking so long to make. The logic board of my computer completely died and I was sans computer for about two weeks there. So I got the thing repaired, it was returned to me and normal service is resuming now. Apologies for the absence. Number two, the reference doc. Lots of people were saying that they'd like access to the reference doc without having to go to Patreon. And if that's what people want, who am I to say otherwise? So there is a link in the description of this video and every video going forward to the reference doc. And anytime it's been updated, a new version will put in that drive. So check there regularly. I will say though that the reference doc, like it isn't cheap to produce because I'm, you know, paying Vanga for his work. Vanga Van Gogh, resident artist, check him out. Links in the description. And I'm also like, you know, paying various other um, experts to come make sure that everything is like scientifically accurate. So like it costs a fair bit to make. So I, I would please ask that if you get value from this and the videos, uh, please do consider going over to Patreon. It just means that I can keep producing this. And if that's not a thing you can do, no worries at all. The link to the Google Drive folder is in the description. All right, preamble done. What are we going to do today? So today we are going to start working on our planet. We've finished the star, we've finished the planetary system, we've finished the galaxy, the stellar neighborhood. We've worked out the broad details of our home world and we've worked out our moon. It's high time we zoom into the planet and begin to think about how it looks in terms of like land masses, climate zones, etc. This process for me, it's evolved over the years. It, it now begins with making a full tectonic history of my world. That is the simulation of about a billion years of tectonic evolution using an app called Gplates. We'll get into that in the next video. Essentially this, this is what I tend to do at this stage. This is a really long and cumbersome process. So to kind of maximize time and efficiency here, I've actually reached out to a chap called World Building Pasta. Links in the description to this. This is by far the best world building blog I have ever come across in terms of like hardcore realism. It is absolutely stunning. I would encourage each and every one of you to go over there and just blitz this site. It is amazing. I reached out to World Building Pass and I was like, hey, can I commission you to do a tectonic history for me? This, I think, has two advantages. One, it means I can financially support other creators I really like. Always a good thing. And two, it frees me up to do more kind of teaching things. So the focus of the next couple of videos won't necessarily be constructing the planet we've built, but rather talking about like what plate tectonics are, what they do, and how to go about simulating them. So it'll be more like tutorial based. And at the end of it, world building pasta will have a world for me and we can see what the process will yield which i think is just is really useful working in parallel so massive thanks world building pasta for accepting my commission and also for letting me take a lot of information that's in the blog and turning it into a video because if you dear viewer are like me i, I tend to learn better from video than i do from written word so massive shout out world building pasta thank you so so much all right let's talk plate tectonics what are they? What do they do? How do we simulate them? So any tectonically active planet will have its crust, its outermost layer, or like its outermost non-atmospheric layer, split into a number of like distinct chunks that we call plates. The crust of a planet will come in two flavors. Either it'll be oceanic crust or continental crust. And the key difference here is that oceanic crust is thin and dense whereas continental crust is thicker and less dense. And as a consequence of these, when these interact with one another, various different landforms like, you know, mountains, volcanoes, trenches, earthquakes, that sort of thing, are formed depending on what types are interacting. And the main place of interaction between these various plates is at the boundaries. So knowing about what the various plate boundaries are and what goes on at them is really important. So let's start there. There's basically three types of boundary. You have convergent boundaries, divergent boundaries, and transform boundaries. Convergent boundaries are boundaries like, say, for example, the Nazca plate and the South American plate, that boundary here, where both plates are moving into one another. The Nazca plate here is traveling east and the South American plate is traveling west. They are converging on one another. Divergent boundaries, as the name would apply, are plates that are pulling apart. 
So the prime example here is the South American plate and the African plate. African plate is moving east, at, at least locally here. The South American plate is moving west. And so that means the boundary here is diverging. They're splitting apart. And the final type is transform plate boundaries. Example here would be like the very earthquake prone American Southwest. This is when two plates, they are neither coming together nor pulling apart. They're just like scraping off one another. In this case, the Pacific plate is moving like Northwest and the North American plate is moving like Southeast. They're scraping off one another. That's a transform boundary. You can also get transform boundaries if the two plates are moving in the same direction, but just at different speeds. Again, producing that sort of shearing, scraping sort of situation. Convergent, divergent, transform. Those are your main types. Within these, there's a bunch of subtypes. So here we have a oceanic, continental, convergent plate boundary. We said that oceanic crust is denser, so it will tend to sink underneath continental crust. Continental crust will kind of tend to like ride up high in this interaction. The features we'd expect along this boundary are a subduction zone and, a, and an ocean trench at that subduction zone. A great example of such a trench is found just off the coast of South America. The Nazca plate is moving this way, South America is moving that way, we have a oceanic continental collision, and we got this beautiful oceanic trench here. Also expect earthquakes, volcanoes, and orogeny. Orogeny just means like mountain building. Specifically at this type of interaction, you're going to get Andean or Laramide style orogeny. These are not like official geological terms. Uh, they're world building past as terms, but I find them immensely useful. Andean orogeny is basically inspired by the Andes. Laramide orogeny is essentially think the Rocky Mountains in the US. We'll talk more about what these are in a second. Next up, we have oceanic, oceanic convergent plate boundaries. Again, we have a subduction zone and ocean trenches. In this case though, the subducting plate it's always denser plate that will subduct and go under in this collision. Oceanic plates are dense, but they differ in density depending on age. The older the plate, the more dense. So this fella here will be a slightly older portion of the ocean, so it'll get sucked under. And again, that's the thing that when we go to simulate um, plate tectonics, we'll be able to figure out. Ocean trenches, earthquakes, volcanoes, and island arcs. So basically the same thing, except there's no land. And a good example of this sort of thing is in Oceania here. Ocean plate, ocean plate, we got an ocean trench and some volcanic island arcs going on. And then we got continental, continental convergent boundaries, the final type or the final subtype of convergent boundaries, where two continental plates bang into one another. Expect earthquakes, orogeny, mountain building, this time of the Ural or Himalayan type. Again, we'll talk more about these later. And you can also get some plateaus. Full disclosure, you can also get plateaus in the Laramide type as well. But again, we'll talk about it in a second. Then we have oceanic, oceanic divergent boundaries. Think the mid-Atlantic ridge here. Africa is moving this way, at least locally. South America is moving this way, meaning here is a divergent boundary. Expect earthquakes, volcanoes, mid-ocean ridges, and volcanic islands like the likes of Iceland. What's interesting to note, because of the geometry of a sphere, Divergent boundaries are like, they form this really cool like geometrical pattern where you have straight sections of transform boundaries and then you get like a divergent section, then a transform boundary, then a divergent section, transform boundary, and they keep forming this kind of like staircase sort of pattern. Very, very indicative of oceanic, oceanic divergence. And then we got the same thing except involving two continents. Continental, continental divergent plate boundary. Same deal just two bits of continent rifting apart. Expect earthquakes, rift valleys, and volcanoes. And a sort of canonical IRL example is the East African Rift Valley, which is like this entire section up here. So that's the two types of divergent boundary, oceanic, oceanic divergent boundaries, and continental, continental divergent boundaries. Now you'd think you'd have oceanic, continental divergent boundaries, but that basically never happens. Because like, if that were to happen, it would really quickly just transition into an oceanic, oceanic divergent boundary. And then we have transform boundaries, either continental, continental transform plate boundaries or oceanic, oceanic transform plate boundaries. Excuse again the pixelation here. 
Expect earthquakes, land deformation, and little to no volcanism, because nothing is being subducted. They're just scraping past one another. All right, so those are the types of plate boundaries and the features we'd expect to be associated with them. Now we mentioned a bunch of orogeny types, so let's look at that. So we can break down the types of mountains that will form over various plate boundaries or around various plate boundaries into four types, Andean, Laramide, Ural, and Himalayan. Again, not official designations, just super useful for world building purposes. You can think of these as being grouped into two, these two compared and these two compared. These two form as a result of oceanic continental collisions, and these two form as a result of continent continent collisions. One is thin, one is wide. One is thin, one is wide. All right? So, Andean style orogeny, like the Andes, occurs when you have a subduction zone along, there's meant to be an A there, sorry, when you have a subduction zone along the coast. Again, prototypically, this is what goes on, shock horror, around the Andes. This orogeny again tends to be pretty thin, say 80 to 200 kilometers. Laramide orogeny, whenever I say the word Laramide, just think the Rocky Mountains. This forms as a result of a mid-ocean ridge subducting under a continent. And yes, that's a thing that can occur. And it can also form actually if uh, the ocean just comes in real hot. Like if it's, if it's speeding towards the continent, it can also form then. This is like the Andean orogeny, except much thicker. Say 750 to 1,300 kilometers. And again, prototypically, this would be the Rockies. You see it's much, much wider than the Andes. And you also get like a bunch of cool topography going on where you get like these like ridges and you get these kind of like basins where land like slumps down. It's, it's a whole cool thing with the Rockies. Again, forms a result of a mid-ocean ridge being subducted or an ocean coming in hot. Euro style orogeny, continent continent collisions, specifically small things like island arcs colliding with a continent or microcontinents, something like that, give rise to a fairly thin band of orogeny, say 500, 600 kilometers. And as the name would imply, this type of orogeny looks like the Urals, which is somewhere up in here. And then you get Himalayan orogeny, shock horror, named after the Himalayas. This is when you get a full-on continent-continent collision. And this is the thick version of the continent continent collisions, say 600 to 1200. I don't know if it could go more than that. Uh, either way, thicker than Urals, or thicker than Ural style orogeny. And you guessed it, it's like the Himalayas. So you got, it's really thick, this orogeny. Lots of land deformation, extremely irregular topography, that kind of thing. All right, those are the four types. So in sum, Oceanic continental collisions, Andean laramide, thin, thick, continent continent collisions, Ural or Himalayan, thin, thick. And again, the simulation process will reveal to us which ones to put where, which we'll do in the next video. All right, but let's talk about how the sort of broad overview of how we're going to simulate. And again, next video will be like the nitpicky details using the program. This is a six ish step process which makes it seem really quick, but it it, I, it really isn't. <laughs> it takes such a long time, but I can't really think of a better way of doing this. We start off with a supercontinent. We draw in that supercontinent, and then we begin to break that continent up. We move the pieces around, and we begin to reassemble another supercontinent, supercontinent B. And then we break that up, and then at this point, we could declare modern world. Now, obviously, you could keep going, like if you wanted your modern world to be a supercontinent, you could go break up assembly supercontinent again. You could basically keep going for as long as you want. And the, the point of taking the simulation through at least two supercontinents and about a billion years of history is to be able to track where mountains occur. So like mountains that formed around this stage would become like old mountains, the equivalent of the Appalachians in our modern world. And mountains that form in the later stages, say, post second supercontinent will become the newer mountains. So like the likes of Andes, Himalayas, that sort of thing. Doing this gives you an accurate representation of what your world will look like. Oh, and I should also mention, there's a thing called the supercontinent cycle, which is what we are emulating here. On Earth, it's about 300 to 500 million years between supercontinents, though it varies. And that's why I say 
a billion years of simulation is a good call. You're allowing 500 million years for each uh, supercontinent cycle. Though, again, you can vary it up if you so desire. That is the basic overview. Let's talk slightly more details. Step one is easy. We'll just draw a big blob of land. Perfect. Step two, the breakup. There's some interesting things here. So when you have a supercontinent, it forms like an insulating layer over the Earth, or at least the portion of the Earth that it covers. And it'll be like a big portion, like we're talking like a quarter of the surface area of the Earth will be taken up by a supercontinent, assuming you have the same land to ocean ratio as Earth. So that's a lot of insulation going on. Underneath this sort of insulated layer, these mantle plumes will evolve, which is kind of like, I guess, columns of like really hot magma that come up and interact with the crust. They will dome the crust, dome it upwards, deform it upwards, and then eventually fracture it into a very distinct triple junction. So a T-shaped fracture, not a cross-shaped fracture, always a T-shaped fracture. A lot of these mantle plumes can occur and create these triple junctions. Like this is Rodinia, by the way. Uh, like here, w which was a, a previous supercontinent on Earth. Like here is a T-shaped fracture. Like here would be another T-shaped fracture. Here's another one. Here's another one. A handful of T-shaped fractures per supercontinent. And the arms of this T-shaped triple junction will like kind of spread. The faulting will continue. And they'll like join up. And eventually as they all join up, they'll shear apart entire chunks of continent. Now, the interesting thing about that is, is we can imagine that this arm will go along to create a fracture, and this arm will go along to create a fracture, and then this whole plate section will move away. But what, what occurs with this arm, third arm, this is, can get real interesting. Either it too continues to go, so that we can imagine like, say for example, in an old history, maybe this arm would continue and fracture off this chunk of South America. It can do that, totally fine. And we will often do this in, a, in the simulation, but it can also just stop and become a failed rift, a rift that didn't rift apart the entire continent. This can be reactivated later, which we'll get into in the next videos, or it could just remain a failed rift. And this represents like a weak point in the crust. So this allows us to place our major river basins. You'll notice here there's a failed rift here, forming the Niger River, modern day Niger River Valley. We have the Amazon here entering the sea along a failed rift. Same thing for the Mississippi, the Orinoco, etc. So the act of rifting apart a supercontinent also, depending on the time involved, can give us modern day river basins, which is just dope. So not only are we tracking mountain building and location of continents, we're also tracking rivers. Class. So that is how you break apart supercontinents. We're going to make triple junctions, join them up, rift the continents apart. Now, the way in which they rift apart, drift away from one another, follows two main tracks. Technically, it follows three, but we don't even need to get into that. I would even say it should just follow one track for the sake of simplicity, and that is this extra version. Uh, let me try and make this bigger. Hold on. Here we go. These are our two tracks, extra version or intro version. This one is the easy option. We should stick to it. This one's the harder option. I'd not recommend it unless you really wanted to get fancy. The process is already involved. Let's not make it more involved. So here's how this goes. We got a supercontinent here. This is a cross section of a planet. We have these subduction zones beginning to form here. Once formed, these subduction zones, this is a oceanic continental collision, are gonna to wanna to force this part of the continent, this part of the supercontinent, this way, and this part of the supercontinent, this way. As such, we've got a weak point here, mantle plume, triple junction, etc., leading to rifting a part of the continent, forming a fledgling oceanic, oceanic divergent zone. This process will continue. You'll notice that this ocean has grown. It has rifted apart. The sections of the old supercontinent have now been really far displaced from where they originally were. And our subduction zone is still going strong. And then eventually what happens is that these pieces of the old supercontinent reassemble themselves on the opposite side of the planet, like 180 degrees away, away from where they started. We got a brand new ocean here, younger ocean crust. 
and we have a bunch of like erogeny happening here and also we'll get a bunch of erogeny along the way obviously because of the interaction between these plate boundaries and the way in which the plates bang into one another but the basic take home is that the outer section of the old supercontinent when it goes through extroversion becomes the inner section of the new supercontinent and then from there you can rift it apart again break it up and take it to your modern world that's the easy mode now the hard mode introversion you start off with a supercontinent we have subduction zones beginning to form this is going to make this continent want to move this way this part of the continent move that way rifting opens same thing as before great then what happens is that these subduction zones die i couldn't tell you why that occurs but it occurs it's a thing which means that we got some rifting happening here so there's gonna be motion this way now meaning we got subduction going on here these these this new ocean that was created basically stops growing and then inverts in upon itself introversion so we got a sucking motion here which means that these continents are going to want to get pulled back from whence they came and they slam right into one another forming a new supercontinent where the old supercontinent was though not necessarily in the exact same permutation all right so in sum extroversion supercontinent spits apart reassembles itself on the opposite side of the globe introversion supercontinent spits apart drifts out for a little bit and then reverses course and slams back into itself on the same side of the planet those are two main strategies please for the love of all that is holy do not do introversion extroversion is the way to go and the final thing i'm going to talk about here thanks for putting up with me folks is as we simulate these extroversion or introversion cycles if you're truly bonkers we're going to come across a number of kind of um recurring i guess plate patterns and it's worth kind of covering them now so that when we meet them in a simulation uh we're not at sea four main types here let's start off with the first one convergent continent divergent we have a convergent boundary here plates are converging then there's a continent and then there's a divergent boundary here like a mid-ocean ridge this should look very familiar this is what's going on in south america nazca plate is going this way south america plate is going that way convergent continent and then the divergent mid-ocean ridge this is the sort of south american system if you will convergent continent convergent boundaries this is a bit weirder because it doesn't really exist on modern day earth this is the kind of typical state of continents in the later stages of extroversion where everything is coming back together a situation that modern day earth is not in we have a convergent boundary here we have an active margin identical to the previous example andean or laramide style orogeny smooth coastline cool but on the other side we also have an active margin and we also have orogeny going on i'm not going to get into the nuts and bolts of this i would encourage you to read world building pastor's blog links in the description but effectively what's going on here the main sort of trust of this continental section is going in this direction but there's also a pull here at the subduction zone so the continent kind of goes full stretch armstrong and begins to be kind of pulled apart along the trailing edge this is the leading edge direction of its kind of predominant motion along the trailing edge this results in a thing called slab rollback the effect of which is that mountain building on this end won't be as high as on this end kind of like major mountain building and like minor mountain building and because of this like stretching out sort of thing you can also get oceanic crust formed behind the orogeny forming a thing called a back arc basin we do have an example of a back arc basin on earth and that would be the sea of japan which is here so you kind of like main continent you have this back arc basin and then you have just to keep our scenario the same the trailing edge and you'll note here that there's no ridge in this little section of ocean so this this thing here could never like expand and be stretched out to become an entire ocean of its own it's like this like trapped basin basically again i encourage you to read world building passes blog but in general standard south american style orogeny here stretched out lower style orogeny here with a possible bark arc basin all right that's convergent constant convergent system number three convergent divergent convergent 
you have a convergent boundary here, plates coming together, a divergent boundary here, like a mid-ocean ridge, plates spreading apart, and a convergent boundary here, plates coming together. It's depicted as being island arcs here, but they could be full-on continents as well on either side. Good examples of this IRL is a situation that occurs between the Pacific, actually let's go this direction, that would make more sense, the Pacific plate, and where is it? The Nazca plate here. I can't tell where the boundaries are. Yeah, that's the bottom of it. So it's something like, like this. That's about the Nazca plate somewhere here. We got diver divergent zones up in here, convergent and convergent. Actually, can I get that all in one shot? Probably not. No. Turns out the Pacific, real big. Now this is super stable, right? Because at the mid-ocean ridge, Spreading is symmetrical, so this is going to spread symmetrically either side, and this is going to be sucked in, and this is going to feed the subduction zones on either end, and this can kind of just keep going for a long, long time. It's a super stable situation, but not always. If there's any kind of like imbalance in the system, one side will subduct more than the other side, and you end up in a situation where this ridge, for example, will get sucked in under here and get consumed, and then the whole system can like shut down, the ocean can close up. One cool thing that can happen though, is that instead of having a single ridge, you can have multiple ridges meeting at a triple junction. Always a triple junction, plates only ever meet at T-shapes, never crosses. And what can happen here under certain circumstances that I don't entirely understand, the forces here can kind of cause this triple junction to kind of spread apart and grow this like triangular shaped plate, like a new oceanic plate from the triple junction. And this is exactly how the Pacific plate was born. And this thing will continue to grow out along the boundaries here. These would be subduction zones because it's subducting the older ocean. And then we'd expect the uh, associated orogeny, volcanic island arcs, etc. And these will like grow along the boundaries of this new plate. And eventually when there's, you know, continents along the other side, they will slam into those continents, forming lots of collisional orogeny and just gives rise to a super like higgledy piggledy coastline. Again, I'd read the World Building Passes blog for a little bit more info if you're interested. This is a thing as a, as a world builder we can declare to do. Like if we have a big open ocean with a triple junction, we can declare I'm just going to start growing a plate from that triple junction, growing it outwards or not. It's up to us. All right. So that's the sort of situations that can occur at a convergent, divergent, convergent plate boundary. Think the Pacific Ocean. Next up, finally, a convergent, divergent continent. This is also really cool. So we have a continent here, convergent boundary. So we'll have Andean or Laramide style orogeny, smooth coastline. Then we have a mid-ocean ridge, and then we have some sort of other continent. Now this is being sucked in from one side, so necessarily this mid-ocean ridge is going to travel towards the subduction zone and eventually get dragged in, forming Laramide-style orogeny. So when this mid-ocean ridge gets sucked in under the subduction zone, you're going to end up with a situation like this. Subduction zone, ocean, continent. This continent has no other choice, asterisks, but to slam into this one over time leading us to a situation where we have continent-continent collision and we have Himalayan or Ural-style orogeny. So that's all pretty straightforward, but there's a small wrinkle here. An interesting wrinkle. Imagine we're back in this scenario, but this continent here, it couldn't move relative to this. Let's say it was attached to something. This subduction zone is going to need to gobble up something. Subduction zones are hungry. They gobble up all before them. And what that necessarily means is that a rift is going to form in this continent here, shearing it apart, forming a microcontinent, which will then be free to move and bang into this. Again, forming similar orogeny to this, but like still having an ocean behind it. The fun thing here is that the only thing that can shut down a subduction zone is a continent-continent collision. Two continents come together and functionally glue together. So imagine a microcontinent splits off here, it moves over here and it slams into this. This will shut down that subduction zone, but the mantle below is still churning in this counterclockwise manner as it was when the subduction zone was active. This means that after the collision of the supercontinent, really quickly in terms of geological time, a new subduction zone will open up right beyond our collided microcontinent, and then the process can start again. Another bit could be shorn off, and that could slam in, 
a new micro a new subduction zone could form because of the motion of the mantle etc so you get this really complicated like um rapid fire again geologically speaking collision of like bits of continent one after another after another again leading you to the situation where you have if the ocean eventually closes and something big comes and slams into it himalayan style orogeny right and those are the four main types again if you want to learn more information about that world building pasta great great blog go check them out links in the description that is what plates are what the type of boundaries are what features we'd expect to occur at the various types of boundaries an overview of the process of simulating plate tectonics over the course of about a billion years and a really quick overview of the sort of patterns one can see during that simulation i think that's it i don't think i forgot anything if i have i'll mention it in the next video speaking of which next video we're going to bust out g plates and i'm going to begin to show you how you can simulate plate, te plate tectonics All right that's us Massive thanks to Vanga Van Gogh, resin artist over here in Artifexia. Go check them out. And a massive thanks to World Building Pasta again. Can't thank the guy enough. So awesome. Go check them out. Also, can't thank you enough for watching. I really hope you enjoyed. Thanks for supporting the show. Thanks for supporting me on Patreon. And until next time, Edgar out.